Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast will include mature themes and scenes. This actual play uses the Delta Green Role Playing Game rules by Arc Dream Publishing. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Dunn, and for tonight's game, I will be your handler. You're all cordially invited to a night at the opera. Thank you for joining us again another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your handler this evening, Handler Michael Diamond, back with another episode of Delta Green Impossible Landscapes. And so at the top of the show, as we'd like to do, we'd like to thank you, the listener, and you, especially you, the Patreon supporter. If you'd like to see what we can offer you on Patreon, you can uh, check us out over at patreon.com slash the Old Ways Podcast. We are also making a push for YouTube subscribers just because we think it would be fun to get to a bigger number. You can help us out and you can comment on this episode on YouTube and maybe you'll get a fun surprise. Who knows? Now that that's done and over with, we would like to get to introductions. So to my right. Hi, this is Miranda and I play Dr. Aaron Weber, a.k.a. Special Agent Olivia Dartford to some. And uh, I guess I'm, I'm elbows deep in glued trash tool wall. Yeah, yeah, no, that's pretty much where you are. You are um, trying to figure out what dissolvent you're going to use to get the rest of this cataloged, probably. Uh, to Agent Dartford's right. Well, hello, everyone. It's your friend, Nate. I'm playing Elliot Winters, Diplomatic Services Special Agent for the U.S. Department of State. I'm starting to think we got suckered into doing someone else's boring housework. I think that's a fair assessment of the situation, given the, well, given maybe the mood at which the NY. PD detective left in. Sounds like you got pulled in on cleanup duty at the end of the table. Hi, this is Allie and I play Joanne Hart or known to other pieces of this table, Ophelia Ward. And I'm on a mission. Indeed you are. And last but most certainly not least. Hi, my name is Tegan and I'm playing Brett Youngbuck Hawking of the Navy Criminal Investigative Service. And as a prior Navy member, I understand that sailors are first and foremost janitors, so I'm used to cleaning up other people's messes. I am portraying to the outside world, though, that I am actually FBI Special Agent Owen O'Neill. I'm ready to do this. Let's go. Fantastic. So hopefully you've all had a chance to stretch at the last intermission and get your you know, assorted drinks and, and uh, snacks. And we're going to settle back in as the curtain raises inside the apartment of Abigail. White. So when last we saw our agents on screen, we saw them uncover a few interesting objects. The room, of course, or the rooms themselves are fairly caked specifically in in the main area with all sorts of uh, different things. You've, you've taken down ashtrays and false teeth and all manner of, of objects, but you, you've also taken down a piece of brown paper with a really strange symbol on it. And you've also removed uh, a letterhead to a hotel. Not really sure. It's got some markings on it. Looks like a, a, a rudimentary map. And the agents had come together last time to, to sort of sort out how the shifts were going to work. There's a lot of work here. And it's not going to be accomplishable in a single night by everyone. And so they've collectively decided that they'd work in pairs. And so what I'll do is I will give the narrative control over to them and let them tell you, the audience how those pairs are going to work and who's going to start and who is going to stop. Well, I think our enthusiastic partner over here wants to stay with me overnight and let you two get some sleep. I don't know what you're implying. 
I've just had enough coffee to win the Kentucky Derby since 3 p.m., so I don't think I could sleep if I wanted to. I won't argue uh, with you about staying overnight. Go go for it. Be my guest. All right, so Ward O'Neill, you, you want us to come back tomorrow morning? You want us to relieve you tonight? I don't know. O'Neill, do you think we need to be relieved first thing? Because I'm probably good until 9 or 10 o'clock. Yeah, that's fine. But here's the deal. Can you snag like some chorizo burritos or something and bring them in? Absolutely. I think too, because uh, what time of night is it currently? Well, the group did a little bit of a search. Mm-hmm. So to do that, they would have had to spend... Uh, probably at least three to four hours collectively, the four of them working it. And they arrived here, if memory serves, probably around five or six o'clock. And they arrived staggered because Dartford and Bennett went to the hardware store to get supplies. So yeah, I would probably say it's between eight, maybe nine o'clock, give or take. I know we had talked about Maybe while two were searching, the other two would be doing some research. But I think in order to do that, we need to split the daytime hours a little bit uh, better. Because if uh, me and Bennett here are here from 8 or 9 a.m. till 8 or 9 p.m., then we won't be doing much research. And that really leaves uh, research and searching to you both. Well, and at that point, we could also have a little bit of a staggering thing for everybody. So everybody has kind of their own shift that overlaps. So whoever is working, say, I don't know, 10 at night to like 430 in the morning, then they can leave and get some sleep and then someone else comes in. So that way we all kind of have time for searching and for researching. I don't want to be here alone, though. I'm not going to... This place gives me the uh, scientific term heebie-jeebies. I don't think that's scientific. I think that's a general saying, but I can't say you're wrong. It's measurable. It's observable. You're also in New York City. Are you ever really truly alone? This whole goddamn town smells like hot piss. The rats of the apartment can keep us company. Uh, what I'm saying is that maybe if me and Bennett came back a little bit later, I know it'll be a long first shift for you guys, then we could get some research done in the morning because I don't think we're going to be getting much done. We're not going to be able to get our feet on the ground getting much done if we're coming back that early in the morning. So I just want to clarify with the rest of you. Nine o'clock's early. Well, it is if we're trying to get research done. I mean, the library opens at in the morning we maybe only have an hour there or any sort of city offices that we would want to go to what are you planning on doing that you expect us to have to go to a library i don't know but we talked about researching things we talked about looking into these things i got this silly we got the silly symbol thing we have this letterhead and i guess we don't have to look into those things we can just collect like little pack rats Okay, I guess the better question is, do you need both of you to do research? No, I'm just just, just saying time. Can we all review one thing real quick? Mm Mm-hmm. What are our orders? Clear all of this shit out. Mm Mm-hmm. Find any crazy, if crazy exists, and I remember it being a big if- stop the crazy by any means possible. What we don't need to go is down like some crazy rabbit holes. Right now, we've got walls and walls of crazy. Let's rip this shit down. Okay, let's, yeah, let's, we'll see what we get in a couple shifts and then we'll go from there, I guess. Yeah, I mean, look, if friggin' Freddy Krueger pops out of the toilet and starts chasing us, then I get it. But, like, right now, it's somebody who had, like, 
an uncontrollable urge to buy the entire town out of Elmer's glue and have a party. Well, I don't think you have to worry about Freddy Krueger because you're awake right now. So, And we all are, so I think we're okay. I don't know. I never saw the movies. All right, very good. So there's a plan in place? So the plan is to delay the plan, I guess. That's fine. So is the plan to say work a little later? Yes? Um, we they, we were going to go and they were going to stay and then we were going to come back in the morning. Okay. And there will be burritos. I was promised burritos. There will be burritos. Oh, Neil, you're looking for a chorizo burrito for breakfast? Is that is that what you want? That is absolutely correct. It is It's essential. Also, like, if they do the red-green sauce, the green stuff. All right. All right. Well, you said something just a second ago. It was sort of interesting to me. She decided to throw a party with Elmer's glue. And obviously, she put looking around. This was an artist who recently sold a bunch of artwork. That's correct. Handler, is there any evidence of artwork being created that could be sold? No. Or is everything permanently attached? Yeah, so to give you a little clarity there, there there are no easels. There are no paint cans. There are no brushes. There are no canvases. There is, for the most part, no furniture. There is no art on the wall. There is no pictures from someone's home. There is no quaint series of photos of her, you know, gray cat that lived with her when she was a kid. There is epoxy and there is junk. And it seems to radiate out from the center of the room that you four of you are standing in. It's appropriate that you should ask that because I'd like you all to make me a sanity roll. Well, I fumbled that roll. 88 over 59. We'll deal with you momentarily. I'm a 90 under 65. Uh, I have a 22 under 79. Very good. 13 under 75. Agent O'Neill succeeded and Ward succeeded. And so we'll deal with the other two then. I'll explain each one in kind so that we, we all can experience them together. Of course, Agent Dartford, you'll be last. Agent Winters, I think looking around the room and looking for the pieces, the vestiges of Miss Wright's life that would give you a sense, even a shelter of normality within this sort of ocean of chaos that surrounds you, it begins to make you feel helpless inside. You begin to to see between the, the lines of all of these things that are stuck together on the walls. It's not just that epoxy was pushed out through a tube and smashed onto the wall so that way yet another piece of this strange... I don't know, a junk dealer's treasure room could be put together. You see the finger prints, the the smear marks in the epoxy in each one of these pieces. You see that the intent, the personalized intent, perhaps a painter's hand here. And you realize that this is something that Miss Wright did very, very personally. And in, in your mind's eye, you get a tremor of that that truth, that vision that she went through. You can see her frenetically pushing these things against the wall and adjusting the dentures just so, or placing this ashtray at this angle, and it builds and builds and builds and builds into this amazing crescendo of just creep that crawls over you. And it isn't that way at all for you, Agent Dartford. Not in any way, shape, or form. What you begin to see from each of these pieces as you're looking around trying to figure out, oh, will this conversation please just get over so that way we can leave? I, I don't want to be here anymore. The heebie-jeebies come that you talked about come alive from the walls. And you see all of these pictures, these things which could project eyes. Uh, you see them and feel them staring at you. It feels like you're a wee child laying on a blanket somewhere completely defenseless. And all of them, all for you, are staring directly at you. And you make eye contact with uh, one of the pieces on the wall. And you see, splayed across it, there are two figures standing side by side. A man in a suit. A nice, you know, suit from the 
maybe the the fifties or sixties, and a woman standing by him in a in a, a red dress, and you see that each one of their eyes has been etched out in big X's over and over and over again. And it's that singular vision of them staring at you with no eyes that just throttles your pulse. And for the rest of you, eh, it's just another Tuesday. I might kind of like reach out and like grab Bennett's like shirt shoulder and (laughs) grasp it really tight. I jump. Oh my. So uh, we can go now, right? As I'm already like backing up and like grabbed on. <laughs> y'all got this? Y'all got um burritos, trezo. Y'all you good? Y'all good. Ten thirty tomorrow morning. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We'll be there. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's go. Uh Darford, let's go. I'm dragging Bennett. <laughs> I've already been moving <laughs> like just death grip on his shoulder. You move out of Wright's apartment. And the hallway that you exit into is very dark. There are minimal overhead lights here. You sort of feel the weight of the chaos of the apartment leave you just momentarily. You take the first breath into your lungs in the past several hours. That has not included some sort of slight remaining fume of epoxy in it. And... If you've ever been in a room that has been a lot of painting, a lot of staining that's gone on, that smell remains for some time. And you're not sure how, after months of this stuff seemingly having been up, it would still remain, but yet it does. And as you close the door there on her apartment, I'm going to have you both make me search rolls. This is an 89 over 60 this time. So not a fumble, just a fail. And I've got a 31 over 70. Uh, you are turning to go because what you want to do is go, Agent Winters. And you look down in just for a moment on the carpet and you see this wide sort of triple diamond pattern carpet that runs the length of the hallway deeper into the, the building. And you pick up on something to your left near, it's got to be near the floorboards in the in the hallway and you can see it sticking up and it looks like there's something here in the floor it's maybe a a metal rod a a pin of something it's weird it's at a weird angle and it immediately jumps to your mind because it sticks out it doesn't it doesn't look right now for just a second no no Ben we gotta I don't like this place just give me one minute. I'm just going to, and I want to bend down and take a look at the floor. Just one second, one second. You kneel down just ever so slightly. You see there's a wire on the floor. It's actually under the rug. And on the other end of that wire, the, on the wall closest to you, you barely have to move more than five or six inches. There's a device attached to it. Is that a, is that a microphone? A look up at, Olivia, uh, Agent Darford, I'll put my finger to my lips and then point down at the box. And then I want to take a, a, a closer look at it. I, sh- I have some skills in, in this area. I might be able to identify. You do. You do. Um, so I'll give you the skill roll. This is not necessary for someone with your talents at this point. Um, when you get down a little closer, you realize that there is a wire that runs under the rug here. And there is a microphone attached to the end of the wire and it goes into Wright's apartment and the other end of it goes that away, like towards a different apartment. Is there anything that gives me a sense how long it might have been installed underneath this carpet? Hard to say. It's not, um, I'll say, I'll give you this. It's not painted over and... It, it's positioned in a way where it has been run underneath the floorboards and the trim. And so it's not tacked down in any way. It isn't like somebody came in here with a T25 stapler and stapled the thing to the ground. Uh, it's just tucked ever so slightly and along the same, you know, the, the bottom of the wall here. And if it wasn't for that little four or five inch pieces of wire, 
that juts out and goes, it crosses the perpendicular angle of the carpet and the wall. You'd have never seen it, but you did. I gesture to Dartford and down the hall a little bit, get a little distance between us and this microphone. And there's someone's mic'd up Abigail's room, the lady's room. Uh, this is going to sound weird, but I felt like the walls were watching me in that place. Oh, yeah, I hear you. It's creep. It gave me the chills. No, but I like, I saw something like, I know she was an artist, but uh, this was, this was something else in the, the stuff that was glued on the, on the walls. That, I mean, I felt like it was looking at me like we made, I made eye contact with the, with, with it. Like, not in a way that's normal, is what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. It's not like things were arranged in a way that looked like a face. It was like there was a face on the wall. There was a person there, it felt like. You ever seen anything like that before? No, 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 no nothing, nothing like that. Nothing weird like that before? No. I mean, I, I mean... I mean, we both know Agent Dunn, so I think we've both seen something weird, things weird before. You two hear a door open. It's not far, just down the hallway. It opens for a second, it pauses, you hear a door shut. Doctor, I really think we should at least take a look, see where this wire goes, but I agree with you. I'd like to get out of here too, but I feel it's our responsibility to sleep. The girl's missing, and this doesn't look like police. Well, yeah, I, I completely agree because, I mean, who knows what they, what was going on with her. I mean, who knows? Let's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you okay to spend a little bit more time? And we, we ain't going to go back in their room for a bit, but. No, I, I think, I think as long as I don't have to go in there, I'll be okay. Uh, I need some space from that, but uh, yeah, let's, I agree. This is something else is going on here and we should at least figure out where that goes. As a matter of record keeping, you both have lost one point of sanity to helplessness. So do I tick next to helplessness then? Correct. Yes, you absolutely should. You're in a hallway. You have found a cable. You've had a little discussion. The door, a door deeper down the hallway opened for a moment or two and then closed. And now you're trying to figure out what the hell you should do with yourself. Yes. I think, I've, well, and I think we agreed we were going to follow the wire. Let's just take a quick peek, see where this thing goes, then get out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sooner the better, but yeah, yeah, we should follow it. And I'll try to follow it without dislodging it too much, if possible. So, Elliot, you carefully walk past an old telephone nook. You see a, a space to your right. It's no more than maybe 10 or so by five or so. And there's an old, an, even an old for, for today's standards in 1995, there's an old telephone on the wall. You see it's rotary dial. See it's got a place to put nickels, dimes, and quarters in. And it's resting there on the receiver. And there's a smell here in this space. It smells like an old man's cologne. Probably something your grandfather might wear. And just passing it, you can see that there's a there's a box on the floor. It's white. Probably by about 18 inches by 18 inches. It's a cube. Uh, and it looks like it's made by a company called Belden. And it's a box of wire. It looks like it's RG59. It's just sitting there. There's a post-it note attached to it. Post-it note reads 175. And there's a little footmark. It's just hanging out there. For a second, you swear you hear the dial tone of a telephone that's been off the cradle for a period of time. Jeffrey, you hear that? I like beeping. Mm. Phone's been off. Never mind, never mind. I'm sorry. I'm just place is creepy. It is, yeah. No, I agree. I 110% agree. But what does this have to do with the wire? Well, I mean, I'm going to pick up the old phone and, the, and, the, and just listen, see if there's a dial tone. 
You pick up the phone and you hear, just for a moment, a sound being played. Almost like there's a harpsichord or some sort of metallic piano in the background. There's a very distinct tone and melody to it. It repeats a few times and then goes distant. All right, you heard that, right? You... Do, do I hear it as well? You put your he- ear up to the receiver and you don't hear it? Nah, I don't hear anything, Bennett. Well, this is ridiculous. All right, all right, all right. Slam the phone down a little bit harder than necessary and start walking quickly in the direction of this wire. Let's just get this done. It actually doesn't go too much further. You trace it out uh, another five or ten feet and it hooks into a door on the right. Right under the door frame. Another apartment? Mm-hmm. The door's closed. Does it have a number? Uh, it does. We can cross, cross-reference the mailboxes. You could. You could, absolutely. Uh, yep, so this is 2B. All right, it goes in here. Um, I'm good. I, f- I feel like I need to get out of here. Uh, I'm good with where we are right now. Is this good for you? No, this is fine for me, yeah. We can go downstairs. I hate to say it, but I don't even want to knock on this door right now. No, we can, I mean, we can get their name downstairs, I think, and maybe look them up or something. Good, good, good. Yeah, let's get, to, let's get out of here. Chills run down my back again. Okay. The two of you walk out of the McAllister building. And I'll move our camera slightly to check on Agent Ward and Agent O'Neill, who are still cataloging and searching Abigail Wright's apartment. So, agents, you have the apartment just to the two of you. You have a wide array of dissolving agents and cleaning supplies and Polaroids to go through. What's your plan? Well, I have a question for the handler first. How much light do we have in this apartment? Not a ton. You have your torches that are left and that's about it. So you have, you have, you know, um, flashlights and that sort of thing. You have the overhead light. So while there's no uh, furniture, there's no stand up lamps, no floor lamps, no small lights. You'd have the overhead for sure, which is a sort of a cracked amber color because it's an old bulb. Okay. Well, the first thing first is that I'm going to take uh, my flashlight, provided it has a nice flat bottom, and just stand it up on the ground because I'll need the extra light if I'm going to be on the floor looking at shit. Okay. Did you know you? What are you doing? I'm settling in. We have stuff to do. What did you think we were going to do here, O'Neill? No, I just... So you solved the lighting with just the torches? I mean, it's not necessarily solved. It's just helpful. Did you say, Michael, there's there's no light fixtures? There's no light fixtures from like floor lamps or small um, small lamps, but there is overhead light. So it's not like the apartment's dark. And so can, we can just flip that on? Yeah, I would assume you probably already had to, given the fact that time of day would eventually elapse where you would have to turn the light on. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we've got lighting. We're going to be fine. Is there, like, an edge to this madness where I can start peeling in chunks? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can start working on cataloging that way, certainly. Do I really have to catalog? I thought we were pretending to catalog. Then our real mission was just to burn everything in a fire. Ugh. That would be much easier. Look. I'm I'm putting through my belt loops a a hammer, a paint scraper, a flathead screwdriver. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I like all those. Those are my favorite tools. If we start chiseling at this, it's like the neighbor is going to come over. And then I take a whack at the wall. Okay. You take a whack at the wall. You start pulling stuff down as best you can. So is the process of events, O'Neill is taking stuff down and Ward is cataloging, or are you both doing sort of your own work? Oh, I was going to use a paint scraper to like chip away 
at whatever's closest to my flashlight without knocking the flashlight over. So I figure we're probably both doing our own work until one of us gets tired and then we'll start labeling and taking pictures. Look, if I see something interesting, that's fine. If it's just dentures and like a chair leg, it's going on the floor. Now, if it's like I suddenly find like an essay explaining perpetual motion or some shit, then I'm going to like, I'll take a look at it. You know, text is interesting. Sure. Yeah, a random cue ball is not. Okay, so we'll uh, do this sort of the easiest way possible. I'll have the agents tell me how long they're going to work for. Are they going to work until 4 a.m.? 4 a.m. and then I'm going to offer to go get a hot slice for me and Ward. Okay, so I'm going to have both of you give me search rolls as you continue to chip away at uh, what is available here. And then, so uh, we will have said that uh, Agent Winters uh, and Agent Weber have gone back to wherever there is that they were staying and they're they're going to be asleep for the night or at least until, you know, three o'clock in the morning, whenever that is. So, yes, this is a search roll. What is this search roll like representing? Just like my attention span on this. Uh, we'll just say that the, the search roll is representing things you might come across while you're removing things. I've rolled a 74 above 50. So it's a simple failure. So you hack a bunch of shit off the wall, basically, uh, in your time. It's bullshit. It's not bullshit. It is mostly bullshit, actually. And probably by like the third chair leg, you're just completely incensed with whoever this person was. You remember that time you had to help your mother take down fucking floral wallpaper that was put up in the 60s and 70s and the shit would just not come off the goddamn wall and so eventually you just decided listen mom you go out and you get a margarita with your friends I'm going to deal with this wallpaper and you dealt with it the best way possible which is to mud over what you couldn't take up because you can't stand wallpaper now and now all of these little epoxied items are starting to remind you of all of the wasted time. Like, this is supposed to be fun. This is supposed to be the the real work that, the you know, I don't know, spy shit that goes on and you're here removing epoxy from a fucking wall. And by two o'clock in the morning, you're incensed. And so you're just grabbing shit off the wall and pulling it down and saying, eh, I'll catalog that later. I'll catalog that later. And that's where you've gotten at this point. So Agent Ward... Uh, I got a 33 under 40. Okay, so a 33 is a double. It is a double closest to your skill roll. So that is a critical success. It is the is probably one of the better successes that you could get. And you are going to find something. So in your more a little bit more methodical method of taking things off the wall, you find what look to be like sort of strange mechanical devices that are drawn onto I don't know, maybe dinner napkins, drink napkins. They're drawn in ballpoint pen, uh, thick paper napkins. They have initials on them, GBR. One uh, diagram of this uh, sort of strange mechanical machines is labeled L-E-A-O. And the A has a slash over the top of it, some sort of line. Uh, the other one is named, labeled E-S-C-R-I-B-A. That's what you find. And then I would ask if you have any mechanics. Uh, no, that's a hard no. Okay. So I'm going to just take a picture and then probably another picture. You take a picture, you take another picture. And when you take another picture, and this is sort of the critical portion of the role, Something out of the right side of that camera flashes back at you. So you have through the viewfinder there, you snap the picture and then you're like, well, I better get another and you slap it again. And when you do something sort of flashes back at you, like something is shiny over to your right. Well, yeah, no, that's a I'm picking up my flashlight and going over to whatever the fuck that is. 
you go over to what that is. It's a piece of paper. It's a piece of, I don't know, dirty, dingy, yellow piece of paper. And there's a uh, sort of a vertical, almost chevron symbol that has been etched into it. It's got some different shapes as well. Maybe that's an, an M or a V. It's very strange. Now you'll make a sand roll. Oh, of course I will. Yeah, that's a 15 under 79. Very good. You do not lose any sanity from seeing this. So I'll just ask what you'll do with it. I'm going to take a picture of it. Of course. You take a picture of it. And I'm going to put this weird yellowed paper with this weird diagram thing. And I'm going to not catalog them separately. I'm going to put them in the same bag together along with the other Polaroids. And I'm going to slip it into the very back of the box so that I know it's there and I know it's safe so that I can show it to the other agents in the morning. Because I don't want it getting lost in the shuffle of everything else that's happening. The night wears on and it draws quickly eventually to morning. And as it does, two agents rise from their slumber. That would, of course, be Agent Winters and, and Agent Weber parading, of course, as Agent Dartford and Agent Bennett, <laughs> respectively. The 3.30 a.m. for you, Winters, is something like out of the old days. That is an early call. But you're awake and hunting chorizo burritos. That's something I got used to skipping that early call immediately the first time I didn't have to make that early call. I'm grumbling. Yes, I want to ask sort of a logistics question, and, and I don't want to get buried in the details, but do the two of you know where the other one is staying at? You're clearly not staying in the same place, and so I, I'm going to sort of assume through, you know, handler magic that the two of you last night at some point said we're going to meet here at this place. Well, we had discussed and I believe carried out the last time checking out a double room or two connected rooms as a workspace so that those of us that maybe aren't staying there because we live in the city would still have that as kind of a rendezvous point in an area where we're kind of collecting things. Fair enough. So I think that would be our rendezvous point. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I'm happy to make a Asian soup with the two of you and you can go burrito hunting. And then eventually, as long as there is something else you're planning on doing, I'll just have you turn up to the McAllister building and uh, to relieve your uh, fellow agents. We feel better once we got away from that in that apartment. And the rest helped a little bit. Maybe for you, Agent Weber, you're maybe dreading a little bit going back. You sort of start feeling the pressure of the room before you get to that first step. Like, you know, walk yourself through the mental paces that you're going to have to step back into the hoarders. You're sort of secretly hoping maybe O'Neill and and Ward got a bunch of work done. And so maybe it's not as bad anymore. Other thought would be, uh, before we go back, is there anything that we want to do with that info that we have? With the wire and who it belongs to, whether it be maybe finding a full name on that person, um, if we have the ability to do so. Uh, I mean, I guess we could run it by Ward and O'Neill before we do anything, but... Mm. Well, you, you'd have had the opportunity to check the box on the outside of the building. Mm -hmm. So you would, at least when you left, so you would know that guy with the last name of Manuel. Looks like it's T. Manuel. First name isn't spelled out all the way. The guy in that apartment's probably got to know that he's got a wire under. He's got to know he's, he's done something. He wouldn't just be sitting there for no reason. It's not like it's a cable TV. There's a there's a microphone on the end of it. Yeah, I was thinking maybe they're sharing a phone, but there's the mic at the end. I think at some point, either the night before or that morning, I I'd call up. Um, my agency, or maybe even the special agent in charge of the FBI, and 
start a just run a search for or have someone else sort of with their research librarian run a search on T Manuel uh, that building the address we have all that information see if there's any criminal history or record so we would know I would hope at some point we'd think oh we should tell our compatriots that they're in a room that's being recorded possibly or mic'd possibly which is one of the things that like totally pops in your head after you wake up which is yeah 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 330 ah fuck what did I say in that room what did I say? What did they say? That sort of fuels your own intensity to like, okay, I, I got to get back to that room. I, I got to tell them, what did they talk about all night? Oh, shit. And I think I wanted to go, maybe we had, we were meeting at 1030. I wanted to go check out the art museum, but not anymore. Not when I was thinking, oh shit, we, we could expose the entirety of what we're doing here accidentally. We got to get back. So Darford, I, we didn't tell him. We didn't tell him we found that mic. We got to we got to get back. It's it's like 334 whenever I have that thought. That's immediately what I'm thinking we need to do. Yeah, so then it, I mean if that's the case we might not even meet at the at the hotel. We might just go straight back there. I think that makes sense. About 4 o'clock or so. You turn up with a four pack of burritos, probably a four pack of coffee which is likely going to be required for the day's events. And uh, the McAllister is pretty sleepy at this point. It isn't yet daylight, but it's pretty close. The streets are quiet. The drive down near Gramercy Park was quiet. 4 a.m., 4.30-ish or so. Morning papers are starting to, to get sent out. The churn of another day as New York City revs its engine back up to be the city that runs most of the economies in America is coming back. And the two of you are entering back into the McAllister. Probably at a pretty hurried pace too, like rushing up the stairs. (laughs) You're so jostling the coffee and the burritos. There's also some, um, there's probably some hash browns in that bag too, I'd imagine. Something. Probably the grease alone is... uh, enough to to wake you up in the morning but you you get back to abigail wright's apartment 1a and i guess the question i have is agents o'neill and ward did the two of you lock the door when they left no yeah no okay so you rush in probably don't you know you don't barrel through the door or anything but you rush through you hear the creak of the apartment door those of you who are inside and uh, those of you who are entering the scene enter a very similar scene from last night it does look like your fellow agents have been hard at work but they're both likely back near the boxes which are addressed for white plains new york where all the evidence is going to be sent to and they're very slowly very methodically cataloging what they have taken down Can we go in and um, do the normal pleasantries and can I pull out like a notepad and write down, we found a microphone leading into the room. And then maybe pointing wherever it might have been drilled through the baseboard. Hey, oh, morning. Uh, We brought the breakfast and I'm like writing and pointing ass uh, real great it's gonna be a good one we made sure to get lots of coffee whoa you guys did some work here last night and i'm gonna look at the note kind of confused i thought you guys weren't coming back until 10 30 this morning oh yeah but we uh you know what burning the midnight oil uh we woke up thinking about you guys we talked to each other and we thought you know it'd be great for them you know, it would be a real morale booster. Early breakfast, early coffee. Behind Dartford, I'm just making all sorts of semaphore flag motions, trying to get you to not keep on that path. Okay, I, I want to look at, at Agent Oscar, and I'm just going to like make a hand motion from my eyes to pointing around on the ground. Where Where is this mic, essentially, with my hand? So I'm, I would just say then for 
Agent Bennett, uh, otherwise known as uh, Agent Winters. It does not take you long to source the mic here because you know about the distance that it had from the other side of the doorway. And he, he walks you right to it, and it's right there. And the, the worst part is, is that none of you like saw it amongst all the junk and all the stuff on the wall. It is well hidden and camouflaged in this sort of environment. I would like to do something brash. Okay. I'm going to pick up the microphone and I'm going to physically follow it, rolling it up in my hands, you know, spooling it up. And I'm going to physically follow it to its location. Where does it go? Knowing that he's going to be making so much noise, I'm out the door and running down to 2B. Okay. And on getting my gun loosened, I'm not drawing it, but standing outside just... It's going to be just wild noise if someone's actually listening, and I don't want them running out the front door. I can see this sort of chaotic scene happening as agents are stepping over each other, and like someone has to handle all these burritos, and the cups of coffee are sort of being set somewhere as people are, are moving now. They're, they're getting into the act of it, and uh, chaos reigns inside Abigail Wright's apartment in a completely different way. Well, I should be in the hallway by now. You are, you are, and being followed very closely by Agent Bennett, who is um, sort of peeling to one side of you to try to get past you. And he does so, and he stands in front of 2B, which is where you roll this thing up to, not but like a minute later, you're standing in front of him with, with the microphone, with the cable spooled in hand. Yeah, I'm going to um, confirm that I have my handgun on my in my holster on my hip I'm looking at Oscar and I it's 4 o'clock in the morning is it uh, it's probably about 4.15 or so by now yeah cool I'm gonna cop knock on this door so you uh, put your hand and wrist perpendicular to the wood door and you pound two or three times and there is a resonant tone of, oh Another pleasant one, actually, that comes out of the wood here at the uh, McAllister building, because all these doors are old and oak. And you hear that pound report and it goes through the hallway. And for a moment, there is just the echo of the pounding. When he starts pounding on the door, I draw my gun. I keep it to my side, safe. It's about as non-aggressive as drawing a gun can be. But now that it's on, I guess it's on. Yeah, um, this is a fact which is not lost on you at all, Agent Hawking. You hear the snap and the pull of another service pistol. And so you know that the agent that's beside you is, is ready to act if necessary. All right, but I'm just going to like kind of put my hand down, like just just chill. All right, I'm going to knock again. And this time I'm, I'm going to say, I guess I'm going to say FBI because I have I have FBI credentials. Indeed you do. You hear a sound inside the apartment and you hear what sounds like footsteps on a wood floor coming towards the door. At first they're a little hurried and then they slow up a little bit and you hear just the metal on the door handle turn a little bit. There's a bit of a whine to the metal and the door sort of opens just a little bit and you see a Latino gentleman He's probably 5'6", five, 5'7", five, 155 pounds. He's got easily 5 o'clock shadow. His hair is coal black. It is not at all in a shapely or um, manly state. It's sort of all over the place. He looks tired. And he sort of stares out the crack in the door and says, Can I help you? Are you uh, Mr. Manuel? Yeah. Hi, my name is Agent, I look at my badge, Owen O'Neill from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I'm sorry to disturb you this evening, but I have a couple questions that cannot wait until the morning. So what I'm going to ask you to do is one of two things. Either allow us to come into the apartment and have a conversation, or would you mind stepping out into the hall? 
And in my other hand, he can't, I don't know if he can see it, but in my other hand, I, I do have the rolled up microphone cable. You don't think that Mr. Man was processing any of that right now? He looks very tired. He sort of stares at you for a second and then stares over at you, Bennett, and is like, what's what's the going on? Oh, is, is he looking at Oscar and asking Oscar that? He looks over between the two of you and then basically in general asks what's going on. As the agent said, we're from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. You have two choices here. Let us into the apartment. We ask you some questions about this wire that we found. Or you come out of your apartment and you answer some questions about this wire that we found. And I'm I'm a little tensed up, stressed up. Being back in the apartment has gotten me amped up again. Yeah. And I think the hopelessness sort of hit when I went into that room. And now I feel like I have to do something. And so there's... There's an aggression there that wouldn't necessarily normally be the way that I proceed. He steps back a little bit and says, yeah, come on in, I guess. He opens the door. He doesn't at all appear as a threat physically. When he steps back from the door and it it opens a little bit, you can see both of his hands. He's unarmed. He's wearing likely, yeah, probably a couple day old underwear at this point, a t-shirt. He's not really dressed for guests in any way. Yeah, I'm going to take advantage because if I'm being invited into the space without a warrant, then I'm going to walk into the space, eyes open, aware, fully aware of, of keeping my eye on him, his body language, his position, any other threats that might be in the space. But uh, yeah, no, I'm leaving. I'm definitely leaving my pistol in the holster. So I would just say the first thing that the both of you would recognize in the apartment, he he does reach over and turn a light on so that he can see what's going on. That light switch is right by the door. So there's no extended movement that he does. You can immediately see that um, this man is really into stereo equipment. There's all sorts of very high quality recording equipment here, speakers, and there's a hi-fi system, like an old school hi-fi system. The stuff that like your dad probably kept in a rack somewhere behind glass that no one was allowed to touch. This is impressive. Is it like, so it's it's expensive. It is absolutely expensive. Uh, So the two of you are going to recognize too, in the immediate space, there aren't any... There are really any magazines. There's no books. There's no coffee table items. There's nothing here like cassettes or compact discs. There's nothing here that sort of lends to the fact that he has a hobby. So hobbyists, as most of you are probably aware of, not only are into the actual hobby, but in this day and age, the pre-information age, super high-speed internet stuff, you subscribe to every possible magazine you could get to, whether it be computer shopper or PC gamer or Nintendo power. Or if you were into outdoor activities, it could be field and stream. It could be, you know, uh, an NRA magazine, whatever, right? There's nothing associated with all of this high end equipment that shows he is super deep into it. It's sort of just a, a little note there. Wait, but you said there was no cassettes and no CDs. Okay. So are there vinyls? Are there eight tracks? I'll say that there are a couple of vinyls, yeah. The one you pick out immediately is the Genesis album. The first thing I'm going to be is like, Agent, would you mind standing with Mr. Manuel over there, please? Yeah, sure, O'Neill. Is this, can we see the entire apartment? Because if not, I think in my current amped up state, I'm going to want to clear it real fast, make sure we are alone. You cannot see the entire apartment from where you are standing in the a space so where you're standing at specifically uh, in this space his apartment goes far left for you further down towards you know d- deeper into the building right and it likely goes a considerable space you see the bathroom door but that's about it he leads you into sort of a, a main section so you do pass looks like a bathroom and then you also pass he go through like a galley kitchen when you get into his apartment where the 
where all of this hi-fi equipment is. Uh, there's also a bed there. By this time is like I, I apologize. What is what's Agent Ward and 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 Dartford? Are, have you are you guys still back there, or did you guys come with us? Or? Yes, that's a great question. I feel like as the scientist of the group, I've been tasked with holding breakfast. <laughs> it's like you guys ran off, and I'm like juggling a tray of coffees and a bag of burritos and like finding a spot in the apartment to put them down and then kind of casually walking back not too casual but I don't want to get there too soon in case anything goes down because I'm not effective with a weapon so let you guys handle that and then I'll uh, swoop in for science okay then you agent one It's very early, and I'm not entirely sure what's going on, which is why this whole microphone thing doesn't quite register in my head right now. So I'm going to grab a coffee, and I'm just going to lean my head out the door, and just, what the fuck is happening down there? I'm just going to watch. I have no reason to go all the way down there. You you eventually see the agents go into the apartment. I can explain to Agent Ward, too, like, oh, so... uh, We found a microphone last night when we were leaving and we forgot to tell you and they went, it goes down to that person's apartment. And so they, I think they went down there to confront them. Okay. Do you think that requires all four of us? I guess it depends on how many people are in that apartment, but I haven't heard gunfire yet. So I think they're probably okay. Let's wait until we either hear a scuffle or yelling, or gunfire at the very worst. And I'm going to go back into the apartment and resume working because I can only imagine that basically O'Neill and I said no words to each other last night because tired and, you know, trying to get work done. I imagine I outlined the entire conspiracy in detail to you verbally. Yeah, there's a hard chance I ignored that. (laughs) I stay outside the apartment for now. Oh, okay. You stay outside in the hallway? Uh-huh. I mean, I'll be in the hallway so I can look in the door or look downstairs as needed, but I, and I kind of I kind of want to glance into the apartment every once in a while to see the walls, like if I see a face again or something, because I still have heebie-jeebies from it. And so it's like one of those weird itches you have to scratch. Like you, there was something there and so you have to look for it again to see if it's still there. Mm-hmm. I think that's a fantastic idea. So why don't you make me a search roll while you're standing in the hallway, sort of giving fleeting glances inside Abigail Wright's apartment, looking for the thing on the wall, which you know is there and you hope you don't see, but somehow you need to see. It's like when the room is really dark and uh, there's something in the corner that looks like a person. So you check it and you know it's not a person, but then you still look back again to see it. That's a 95 over 60. So you, you don't see the the picture on the wall it, it it must be on the other wall it must be you step back a little bit just to sort of get some breathing room from the apartment but still able to hear agent ward working inside or you know just to feel the comfort of that there's another person around here and you bump a little bit into the the curved wall where that old telephone nook was and you notice the box of wire is gone and in fact, there's no phone in that nook, nook anymore. The spot on the wall where it was is missing. I'll have to make a note of that to share with Bennett when he's done with whatever. I kind of glance around. Is there like a dust around it? Like, does it look like there was a phone there at one point in time? You're sure there was a phone there at one point. At one time, Bennett took the phone off the receiver and asked you to listen to it you know you know that it was there at one point i mean there are holes in the wall there now well, who would come take a phone that's so we i mean it's been here it's so old it's strange very strange so back inside mr manuel's apartment he sort of you know uh subcon- subconsciously scratches his balls and asks how we can help you so what's your name what's your first name thomas Okay, Thomas. And while I'm having this conversation and Agent Bennett is is maintaining positive control of him, 
I'm going to go ahead and continue to wind up this cable. I need to know where it's going. You actually tuck sort of around a, a corner a little bit and find the wire dead ends at what looks like a, some sort of cassette deck. It looks like it is uh, a cassette recorder, so I will say that it is handheld. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and pick that up while I'm having a conversation with Thomas, pop it open and see if there's a tape inside. Yes, there's a tape inside. Okay. That's in my pocket now. Violating the this person's rights, I'm going to distract him. Do you have you have an ID sir, or anything I can look at a license just to confer? And uh, can you confirm that you're alone? You live alone in this in this beautiful apartment. He nods and goes over to a dresser and picks up yesterday's pair of jeans and puts them on and then fishes into the back pocket and pulls out his wallet and hands you his New York driver's license. I verify. Pictures him, names him, addresses, correct? Yep, all that's correct. Thomas, Mm -hmm. do you have a reason that you are running a microphone cable from your apartment into an active crime scene? Do you have an explanation for that, Thomas? He looks a little befuddled. What? I'm going to go ahead and throw the cable and cassette player, now empty of cassette, kind of down on the floor in front of him, and I'm going to be like, this is what I'm talking about, Thomas. Is there a reason, a good reason, why you have entered, obviously entered, or violated the sanctity of a active crime scene in order to run a microphone in there that you can explain to me that'll make me feel not upset? He looks genuinely fuddled. Um, it even deepens a little bit. I think I also look befuddled at that last moment. The agent talking about being upset. I, I give him the same look that Manuel might be giving him for a second. I I don't know where that came from. I don't know. I don't know what it is. That's fantastic. Knowing that you don't know where it came from and that you don't know what it is means that it's not yours. No. Okay. Okay, Thomas. How long have you been living here, Thomas? Oh, a couple of years. He seems to absentmindedly walk towards the galley kitchen, which is not far. It's maybe 10 feet or so, and he starts the coffee maker. Yeah, I'm going to keep an eye on his hands. Why are you in the apartment at all? Me or Thomas? Is Thomas asking me that or are you yeah, asking me easy. that? Thomas is asking you. You know what? That's a fantastic question, Thomas. Um, I'm sure that you understand that there was a disappearance out of that apartment. Did you know the individual that lived there? I'm not answering his question. I'm replying with a question. Let me see if Thomas picks up on that. It would take a pretty sharp person to pick up on that. That's a 33. He stops for a second. Hey, no. No, I I asked you a question. Why are you even in the apartment, the, the building at all? He seems to get a little defensive. You know what? That's completely understandable. Let me explain some things to you here. All right. We, there was a disappearance in the apartment down the hall several months back. Now, that apartment is full of evidence and that is being removed. I am with, and so is my friend here, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, while we are conducting this very boring and routine operation, Something exciting happened, Thomas. We found a microphone in that space, and that microphone was attached to a cable. And that cable was attached to your apartment and this cassette player in your apartment. And so I want to believe that you're just some fucking weirdo who likes to record the ambient sounds in crime scenes, but... Seeing as that it's an active crime scene and you're interfering with it, you're kind of breaking the law. And I kind of need an understanding or or, a reason why you're doing that. Reason why you made those series of choices for yourself. Yeah, listen, I, I don't know where it came from. I mean, I'm a painter. That's what I do. 
you're a painter. Yeah. Is there evidence of, of him being a painter here? Mm -mm. Nope. Mike, when O'Neill threw the cassette player on the ground, did Manuel react? Not really. Like, if I took a favored item of yours and I threw it on the ground, you'd react because you have some sort of connection to that object. He doesn't react at all. When O'Neill reiterates, followed the cable back to the cassette player, does it, I'm watching his eyes, does he look towards the broken cassette player on the ground at all? No, he barely even registers that it's a thing. As you're sort of scoping the scene and, and watching O'Neill go through this, you come to the revelation a little bit that this apartment does visually look a little strange. It's not just that there are not magazines or anything like that. This place looks like a hotel suite. It's like it lacks a personal touch. It's very neutral. There's no art of any kind. There's not even books on art. There's nothing that backs up his statement that he's a painter. The wall of hi-fi equipment. I'm really, I'm, I'm picturing uh, Back to the Future, I think. But the wall of hi-fi equipment. I want to walk over to it and I just... I'm watching him and I'm, I'm giving O'Neill sort of an eye as well. I'm mm. moving away from the suspect, so keep an eye. Sort of walk over and I'm just gonna pick up maybe a record. You said there are a few vinyl records and Mr. Manuel, what kind of things do you paint? I'm just gonna toss the record on the ground and see if there's any sort of reaction. He looks at the record, like the, the one on the top, just the first one you found. It's a, a Genesis album. Invisible Touch. No, nope, it's the lamb lies down on Broadway. He turns to you. Hey, be careful with the records. He comes over and picks it up and kind of walks over and puts it back in its place. Sorry, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. I, I know about the, the disappearance. I know she's gone. I mean, the cops have been in and out of the hallway a couple of times. They asked me some questions. I didn't really see her much after the end of May. Abby wasn't a person that the city could really hold, really. She always had something else going on, you know? So what kind of things you record from her? Huh? Furrows his brow a little bit. Record? Yeah, and the, and the tape player that my associate mentioned. I don't know. I, I haven't done any recordings of her. I mean, she's been gone. And I don't know where that thing came from. Is there a is he lying role? Yeah, there is. So that's a uh, human judge to see someone's intentions. Should, should I also roll that? You should 100% roll that. The two of you questioned him long enough. Let's see. Let's see how late night has affected his ability. God damn it. I, I rolled a 69. Nice. Uh, over 60. Uh, so you, you're not really sure yet how to read him. Uh, O'Neill, but for you, for you, Bennett, this guy, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, the guy has no idea what you're talking about when it comes to this tape recorder. He's being completely honest. He doesn't know where it came from. He doesn't know how it got there. Um, everything in his body language and the way he talks about it and the way he reacts to it, most importantly, shows you that he doesn't know what the fuck you t anybody's talking about when it comes to this thing. He steps over back to the coffee maker and says, uh, you want some coffee? And I'm going to call our session to a close there. We will draw our curtain. We will leave our players upon the stage. And you will have an opportunity to get up and get some refreshments, stretch your legs, and perhaps enjoy the intermission. I hope you have been enjoying our uh, playthrough of Impossible Landscapes, uh, written by Arc Dream Publishing under the Delta Green banner. And we look forward to seeing you for the next show.